So we left off here. We had realized that we were in trouble because if we don't know mu, we don't know sigma. If we don't know sigma, that means we're stuck using s, and s is always going to be a little bit larger than sigma. It's not um, a perfect estimator of sigma, if you will. So then we followed the path of William Gossett, the guy who worked for the Guinness Brewery, and he invented this other statistic instead of z, instead of the standard normal. He invented his own called the t, which is very similar to the standard normal. Um, and he calls it the T distribution, or that was called student's T distribution after him. And we learned about it. It's got bigger tails. It's got a narrower, um, excuse me, a shorter peak and fatter tails than the normal curve. And then we learned that there's infinitely many of them, that there's tons and tons and tons of T curves based on your N or your degrees of freedom. And degrees of freedom being the denominator of that, um, of the S, right? Since this curve was built off of S. So... Uh, remember, I don't know if you remember this from way back in chapter 3, 2, but when you take all your deviations, not squaring them, but when you just take the regular deviations and you add them up, it's got to be zero, right? And so the first n um, minus one items or data points can be whatever they want, but that last one has to be whatever it takes to make it so that the, that numerator without the squaring would be zero. So that's what roughly where the degrees of freedom part comes from. All right, so let's look at the lovely t-curve. And these are the properties of the t-distribution, which is drawn down here for you. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. And I know I had blanks in the notes, but here they are filled out. So there's different t-curves for every different degree of freedom. That means there's infinitely many t-curves. Just keep that in mind. The t-distribution is centered at zero and is symmetric about zero. So it looks a lot like the normal curve that way. The area under the whole thing is one. So that means the area to the one half is, or excuse me, to the right of zero is a half. The area to the left of zero is a half, just like the normal curve. As t increases or decreases without bound, the graph never approaches but never equals zero. What they're talking about there is the asymptote thing, how the t curves get closer and closer and closer to the, to the x-axis down here, but they never really reach it. All right. And then the last part, number six, I think you'll see as we look at this. So one of these had degrees of freedom 15, one of them has degrees of freedom of six, and one's the normal curve. So you can see I've labeled each one here. So degrees of freedom at six is this blue one, the one with the shortest peak and the fattest tails, right? Because we learned right back here that degrees of freedom, right, bigger degrees of freedom will have less spread right then smaller degrees of freedom so if, if you have a larger n it's going to be less spread out and taller peaked so if you look down here the blue one is more spread out right so it has the most spread okay then the degrees of freedom is 15 it's got more spread than the normal curve but less than df equals six I will make that big enough that you can actually see what I just typed. Okay, so that orange curve in the middle, that's degrees of freedom is 15. It's more spread out than the normal curve, but it has less spread than this blue one when degrees of freedom is 6. And then the normal curve is the gold standard that we wish everything would adhere to, which is the, gold, the green one, right? And that's what we're kind of noticing right here is that as n increases, that means your degrees of freedom increases. And as your degrees of freedom increases, your curves get closer and closer and closer to the normal curve. Normal curve being the best, most awesomest curve you could have. And you can see it kind of right here with this one. So remember, back the page here, this was the normal curve, right? See how tall it is and see how there's almost nothing that you can visually see past, just a little bit past three standard deviations, All right? This curve, when n is equal to 5, doesn't look that much like this one. It's got way fatter tails, it's got a way shorter peak, all that stuff. But when you look down here, look at this curve down here, when n is just equal to 10, do you see how much that's m looking much more like that z curve? Now it still has values down here at 4 and 5, it's not the normal curve, but it looks a lot more like it. The bigger your n is, the more it looks like the normal curve. And that's what number six is saying in this blue box. As n gets larger, then that curve, that t curve, gets closer and closer to the normal curve. All right, so let's learn how to find some critical t values. 
And we're going to do this several ways, including a table. So we'll do this lots and lots of ways. So I want to find T.02 with 20 degrees of freedom. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to stat crunch for the heck of it. Go to stat, go to calculators, go to T. See T right there? T. Okay. What's my degrees of freedom on this sucker? Let me go back here. Ah, 20 degrees of freedom. Okay. So I'm going to go, oops. I gotta bring the Java up. There it is. So 20 is my degrees of freedom. I want the probability that x is greater than or equal to because it said, um, remember, I'll make a note. Recall that notation, that little sub 0.02 means that the area means, oh my goodness. I can't type, <laughs> means that the area to the right of that t value is 0 0.02. Okay, and That was a notation we learned before, and it's back. Okay, so that means that the area to the right over here is 0 0.02. So I'm going to make it a little right hand and make it point to the right. I'm going to type 0 0.02, enter. And there it is. You can see it's 2.19. All right, I'm going to do my old snapshot thing. This is 9.2 example 4a export and then I'll go to my results. Oops. Mm -hmm. There we go. Copy. And I'm going to put this in its own thing in Excel because this is different than the pickpocket. We'll be back to the pickpocket example later. But this is 9 to example 4. Okay. And there we go. So I've got it right here. I'll use that picture later. All right. So that's stat crunch finding it. Let's find it with Excel. So stat crunch claims, oops, I better zoom in. All right. Stat crunch claims that the t value would be equal to t 0.02 would be equal to 2.1966577. All right, now how could we find that with Excel? Oops, sorry, I just copied and pasted a little bit in here. Okay, now the thing about Excel is that Excel always does left area by default. So if, if you type T inverse, T-I-N-V, or T dot I-N-V, which is the one I prefer, that's the newer one. If you look at probability, it's the left tail probability that they're talking about here. Well, we don't have the left tail, we have the right tail. The right tail was 0.02. So the left tail is 0 0.98 comma 20 degrees of freedom. So you've got to remember to do the left tail in this sucker if you're going to get it right from Excel. Oops, I shouldn't have done that. There we go. So if I just type that, right, that's how to do it in Excel. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put this here and this here. That way we can see the notation. Now, if you do old school, um, let me let me try to remember that. That's one of the things that they really changed a lot from old Excel to new Excel. So it's quite different. So new Excel T dot inverse takes the left tail probability. Let me just make a note to myself. Okay. If you're going to use, um, if you don't have the newest, if you have the old one, probability I could spell. If you have old Excel and you're stuck with T inverse, the problem with T inverse is T inverse with no dot in it does the two-tailed probability. It treats everything like it has two tails. Ugh. Okay, so what you have to do is TINV 0.04 comma 20. That's what you're going to do. See, I don't this is one of the things they changed and I'm so glad they did but they made everything so that it was two-tailed automatically so if you want to get the right number you have to say okay this is 0.02 so the other one would be 0.02 that's 0.04 together and then type that in instead right whereas the newest version t dot inverse just says take the left tail probability like like norm inverse does so left tail is 0.98 comma 20 so that's how to do it in Excel but there's also a table, and I just wanted to show it to you because I give you that table on your exams and stuff. So you might as well know how to use it. Now, where do I get the table? If you click on Tools for Success, it's the formula table card, which is a good place to start, honestly, for, for figuring out what formulas you should have on your note sheets for your exams as well. So they're right here. 
but down here, ah, there's some tables. Okay, so we're looking for this one right here, the T distribution. See that? And this one is automatically the area in the right tail. So we said the area in our right tail was 0.02, so this is the column we want. And then our degrees of freedom was 20, and there it is, 2.197. So you can see it right from the table that it's 2.197. So you could totally do this problem on an exam, even if you didn't have a calculator or anything with you, right? because you'll always be given this table. Matter of fact, you'll always be given all of these tables that I have right here. So this table one, two, three, four, these tables right here, you will be given in an orange packet, or maybe it might not be orange, but some kind of packet with every exam. All right, so there we go. From the table, we can also see that it's 2.19. I'll just copy and paste this in. To my lovely notes so that way I know how I did it and actually I really like that picture in there so let me go grab that as well because I think it's helpful to have these pictures that way we have a sense of kind of what was going on here all right there you go you can see so we've got 2.197 that's our answer and then this kind of gives us a graphical image of what was happening